All right, we're beginning a new sermon series today um, on the Psalms. It'll be five weeks long as we move into the summer. Uh, the Psalms are the prayer book of the Bible. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called them, the prayer book of the Bible. And uh, there are a number of different kinds of Psalms. There are really, it depends on how you do the breakdown, the taxonomy, probably six. We're going to look at two today, praise and thanksgiving, and uh, be talking about how we can practice that kind of prayer in our lives. So listen now as you hear Psalm 145 uh, read, just the first part of it, and get in touch with that praise and thanksgiving within you. Our reading today comes from the 145th Psalm, verses 1 through 7. I invite you to follow the scriptures printed in the bulletin insert as I read. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I wonder if you've uh, ever been awestruck. You know, just where you can't, you're just like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I was... Uh, I was looking on the internet about uh, who, who we might be awestruck to see. And uh, it, it came up who the world's most admired people are. Uh, this, will, this will humble you or, or sadden you or something if you look that up, I'll tell you. But uh, number one was Bill Gates. You know, you know who number three was? You, you, you wouldn't guess. Jackie Chan the number three most admired person in the world, Jackie Chan. Oh my, uh, what have we come to? Anyway, um, so here, Lisa Westheimer is a Roman Catholic woman in New Jersey, and when, in 1994, when she was a very young woman, uh, she received a call from her local priest, uh, Father Peter. Father Peter uh, said, uh, don't you have a four-wheel drive vehicle? And she said, yes. Apparently, it was in the middle of a snowstorm. And uh, Mother Teresa had been stranded in New York by the snowstorm. And Mother Teresa uh, said the Mass or, or went to Mass every day. And they were looking for a priest who would go and say the Mass. So Father Peter said, if you have a, a four-wheel drive vehicle, you can take me up to Harlem and I, uh, it'll be a great gift to you for you to be able to meet Mother Teresa. And sure enough, they went up there. She expected there to be a big cathedral full of people. In fact, there were just five of them in a small room. Um, Father Peter uh, said the mass and when it was done, Mother Teresa looked at Lisa and say, sit here, let's talk for a while. What would you say to Mother Teresa, what would you say? I, I don't know what I would say. I think I would just like sit there. Um, you know, I don't, I think I'd be uh, just so awestruck by that moment, by the goodness of the person with whom I'm sitting. Well, what would you say if it was Jesus? Jesus calls and says, hey, let's meet at the Starbucks. Let's have a talk. So you meet at the Starbucks and you know, you get your latte and you sit across from Jesus and Jesus says, so talk to me. What would you say? I, <clears throat> here's the deal. There are some times when we can't find the words to, to share that which is most profound within us. I'll tell you a secret. Um, you know, when these tragedies come around, the Santa Fe or Parkland or you, you name it, as a pastor, I feel like I'm supposed to say something. You know, you can't just let it pass, can't ignore it. 
and you, you want to write something, and so you, I get out my laptop to come up with something to put on the church Facebook page and web, and web page, and, and I start t- try and type a prayer of some sort, and everything just seems so not enough or so inappropriate or tried or something, right? Because in the, in the truth is the most profound things down at our core, we just can't seem to find the right words. Well, thank goodness for the Psalms. Because the Psalms are our prayers. They are the prayers that we can pray to God to, to give voice to the most profound things that are at the core. When we are, when we are come into the very presence of God and find ourselves awestruck, and we can't seem to find the words to say, the Psalms are there for us. You know, the Psalms serve as both, uh, excuse me, the Bible serves as both prophet and priest. Here's what I mean by that. The prophet is one who speaks to the people for God, right? So the prophet would come and say the word of the God to the people in whatever uh, place and offer this word from God. Well, the Bible is a word to us from God, a, a revelation to us from God. But the Bible is also our priest. A priest was one who spoke to God for the people, right? Who interceded the other way. And the Bible is also our priest. It gives us words. It, it, it expresses that which is within us to God. Now, one other piece to this that you need to understand is that when we pray... When we pray, we're not just giving expression to that which is within us, which is what we are to do, in fact, but but also our prayers are are designed to lead us. They are a leading edge in our life. So um, as we pray, our lives will follow. As we pray in a disciplined, diligent perseverant way, our hearts and our lives will follow those prayers. The Bible speaks of really two, two, of two things that are leading edges for us. One is our prayers and the other is our money. There you go. Right? The scripture doesn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be. It says where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Right? So as we give our lives, our hearts follow. As we pray, our lives, our hearts follow. Now, the the Psalms are not just the prayer book of the Bible, they're also the song book of the Bible, right? Uh, the, the, The Psalms together are called the Psalter, spelled with a P like Psalm, the Psalter. And it is, in fact, the hymnal, the the, the, uh, song book of the Bible. There are more um, manuscripts, 10 times as many manuscripts of the Psalms as there are of the rest of the Bible put together. Uh, The Psalms were just such an important part of giving expression as the people of Israel would gather to worship and sing, the Psalms were their hymnal. And music always functions that way, right? To give expression to that which we're feeling. You've just, your, your, your boyfriend just cheated on you. And so you turn on a country western song, of course to give expression to that which is with you. Listen to Miranda Lambert's song, Kerosene, and you say, how did she know that I wanted to burn down his house? (laughs) Because that's what the song is all about. I'm going to burn down his house, right? It it finds that and you go, yes, that's exactly right. So, So our worship music not only gives expression to what's within us, but it leads us to. It sets our theology. I'm going to ask you this question. Let's pretend I came to you and I said, all right, right now I need you to recite to me 10 verses of scripture from memory. 10 verses. Let me go. Let me have them. Well, you'd begin, Jesus wept. Okay, I got one. (laughs) And then you'd start, you might get through the part of the 23rd Psalm. But if I came to you and said, Give me 10 verses, 10 lines from a hymn or worship song. You'd have no problem at all. You could come up with those. 
because they form so much of what we do together. They lead our lives. So um, I hope during this whole season, this series where we look at all the different types of psalms, that you'll begin to practice those things and, and let the psalms give expression to your, to your prayers and your songs and, and also let them lead. Now, I, uh, t today we're going to be talking about psalms of praise and thanksgiving. And I thought it was really important that during this series, we not just talk about them, but we actually do that. We actually say and sing the psalms together. So I've, I've asked Sid Davis and his great team here to lead us in a time of singing praise and thanksgiving and to teach us a little bit about the psalms as they do that. And so I want to challenge you. Some of you are like, oh, man, I don't sing. Um, you know, give it a whirl. You'll be surprised, and I think you'll enjoy it. So uh, let's listen and participate as Sid teaches us. Thank you, Tom. I have some really good news. This is going to be super easy. I know you are probably thinking he's going to make me sing things I don't know, but you'll be surprised at how much you do know actually is tied to the Psalms. And I'm not going to mention the, the specific Psalm scriptures themselves. I'll leave that to you to look up, hopefully not during the rest of the sermon, but you can look those things up yourself. I think there are three basic categories. Hymns based on Psalms that are familiar, but we probably don't use them very often, if at all. Some unfamiliar ones that are very easy to learn, and then some very familiar hymns that we do use often, but we just haven't made the connection between the fact that that hymn paraphrase, our poem, was written, and it was actually based on a psalm. Let's start with hymn number 75. You'll find the words to these three verses from these three hymns printed in your bulletin insert, but if you'd rather follow along in the, in the hymnal, it's hymn number 75. The words are based on Psalm 100 and fitting for today since we're all about praising God today. Let's sing this together. Of you, most of you are thinking, now wait a minute, I know this, that's the doxology. And yes, that is the melody for the doxology. You would be right, sort of. This tune is actually called Old 100th because it's been associated with the 100th Psalm for so long. And it is the tune that we use for the doxology, which we will do later on in this service. But it's important to know that this, this isn't the doxology. It's a doxology. A doxology is a hymn of praise to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is the one we've chosen. There are actually many doxologies in our hymnal. We'll sing that again in a few minutes. Now to our second psalm, our hymn based on a psalm. You may look at your hymnal. It's number four, uh, 142. But while you're turning to that Psalm 55 paraphrase, let me say a couple of things. Um, it is often something that we think that a, a, some, a song in a minor key is sad, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, also, you may think that you need to read music to learn this music, and you do not. This is really simple, and I could sing it to you, and you could sing it right back to me. In a minute, I'm going to ask Rob and Virginia to play the first, or a verse together just so you can listen, and I want you to take note of how sad this music is not. Even though, it is, even though it is in a minor key. But it's also important to note that the author of the text also wrote the music, which is not always the case. And this psalm paraphrase was written after he went through a very difficult time. He lived in 17th century Germany and was traveling from one village to another and was robbed of all of his belongings and all of his money. And for a long time, he went from friend to friend and stranger to stranger before he got back on his feet. And it was out of that that he wrote this poem based on Psalm 55. So listen to this music.
let's sing that together. feels like a dance because it was a dance. Last of all, a psalm that's so familiar, or a hymn that's so familiar based on the psalm, that when I was little, I thought that this, this hymn should always be sung on Sunday mornings, O Worship the King. But we rarely stop to think about the fact that this particular poem was based on Psalm 104. Let's sing the first verse of O Worship the King together. Offertory later this morning is also based on a psalm, Psalm 46. And even though there are multiple stories about its origin, Martin Luther probably wrote it as the plague approached his city, based on Psalm 46. So I hope you now will be on the lookout for all things psalm related in the hymnal because it's pretty much everywhere. And if there's a question that I can answer for you, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sid. That was awesome. Uh, you always learn stuff, of, you know, in worship team, he throws out something about a hymn. I'm like, wow, that's good to know. Uh, look, I want to tell you something uh, before we talk about these. I want to really want to invite, challenge, prod, whatever it is uh, with you all to um, some of you like, I just don't like to sing in church. I just, I, I, I rather, you know, and I see you stand and uh, don't participate in the singing. And I just want to encourage you to give it a little try. You don't have to sing loudly. Like when I sing, my wife standing next to me, she says, shh, <laughs> uh, because I am a loud singer, not always a good singer. But, and if you're not ready to actually sing, open your hymnal and follow the words along so that at least you're connecting mentally with the expression that's there. Uh, it, it really, again, the point is to begin to lead our lives. So today, these, these hymns that we're talking about today are, are um, songs, psalms of praise and thanksgiving. Now, many of you have learned to pray using the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, uh, ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, supplication. A for adoration, C for confession, T for thanksgiving, S for supplication. Supplication means uh, uh, asking for something, either for someone else or for yourself. So um, today we're talking about the A and the T, adoration and thanksgiving. And, and what I'd like to do is I want to use as our guide the, the uh, prayer that you may have said as a child, uh, before the meal. Um, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. We still say it at our house. So if you took off the for our food, you've got a picture of, of hymns of adoration and thanksgiving, of praise and thanksgiving. The goodness of God, the greatness of God, and thanking God. Let's start with, uh, I'm switching uh, good and great, and I want to start with good. Let us, uh, God is good. And, and well, listen to the, um, the beginning of the psalm we read. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. So anytime you see the word name in Scripture, and replace it in your mind with the word character or the word nature. You could go either way. A name stood for someone's character. So, for example, it says, and you shall name him Jesus, 
for he will save you, save the people from their sins. Because Jesus, the word Jesus literally means one who saves. And you shall call him Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. So when we praise the name of Jesus, we're saying uh, of God, we're, we're saying we're praising the character of God, the goodness of God, the nature of God, that God is righteous, that God is true, that God is just, that God is loving, that God is merciful, the goodness of God. There's a, a little um, liturgy that is sometimes done that goes this way. Uh, the, the leader says, God is good, and the people say, all the time. And then the leader says, all the time, and the people say, God is good. Let's try it. God is good. All the time. All the time. Good. good. That was pretty good. <laughs> Could be a little more enthusiastic, but that's all right. <laughs> You're Methodists, you know. Amen. This is an amen. If I see somebody nodding like that, uh, that's as good as I get, you know, uh, from something like that. So when we say God is good, what we're not saying is everything's good. We're not saying that right in the midst of, of uh, that, that God somehow, uh, so yesterday, I don't know if you saw in the news that an uh, eight-year-old child uh, died, uh, drowned in a swimming pool. That's not good. And if in the midst of that you say God is good, you're not saying, well, God did that and that, that makes it a good thing. What you're saying is in the midst of a world that is filled with all sorts of things, good and bad, the anchor that we're going to hang on to, the one thing that we will hang on to is the goodness of God because that's not changing. God is good all the time. You know what I would say if I sat down next to Mother Teresa? The first thing I would say, you're amazing. <laughs> I, I just am in, I'm just in awe of your goodness. She's a human being. What, what, if, what if I was going to, what if I'm going to say something to God? Now, let me just say that this is one of the, the things that's hardest for us to learn to pray. You know, you, you're trying to find words and and it just seems like you're saying the same thing. Oh, you're amazing, God. You're so good. You're so righteous. You're so just, right? This is one of the times that the Psalms and our hymns can help us the most. That when you begin with ACTS, adoration, and you can't find words, use the Psalms because it's filled with statements over and over of the goodness of God. And it'll help, you know, uh, the first hymn in the United Methodist hymnal always is the, West, uh, the Wesley thing, hymn, O 4,000 Tongues to Sing. Uh, o 4,000 Tongues to Sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name, thy character your goodness, to tell the world how good and righteous and just and loving and merciful you are. Okay, so God is good, but the second half is God is great. So when we talk about the greatness of God, we're talking about God's mighty works, the amazing things that God does. Listen. Great is the Lord. This is the very next verse. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and sing aloud of your righteousness, your amazing and mighty works. Some of you have read the uh, book by um, Anne Lamott called uh, Help Thanks Wow, the three essential prayers. Those are the three essential prayers, help, thanks, and wow. Here's what, here's what she writes. When we are stunned to the place beyond words, we're finally starting to get somewhere. Where, where it is 
It is so much more comfortable to think that we know what it all means, what to expect, how it all hangs together, when we are stunned to the place beyond words, when an aspect of life takes us away from being able to chip away at something until it's down to a manageable size and then we can file it nicely away, when all we can say in response is, wow, that's a prayer. To just be amazed one of our members emailed me this week and said that when you walk into, uh, that interior de designers, decorators will tell you that when you walk into the front uh, door of a house, the wall that you see first, they like to call the wow wall. That you want to put something on that wall that makes people go, wow. This house is really, cool. the rest of it may be pretty shabby, but this, ho this house must be really, I like to think of sunrise as God's wow wall. That every morning when the sun comes up and it's light again and the birds begin to sing and a new day is given us, wow. We're headed uh, to Colorado for vacation this summer. Uh, all, we call it pacecation. We do once, one week a year and it's uh, all four sons-in-law and all five daughters and all nine grandchildren and my wife and maybe me. And uh, we have a great, we're going to Colorado, we go different places and I'm counting on a lot of wow time to just look around and go, wow, oh my God, this is incredible. Do you ever have that experience? Here's what the physicists tell us. This, this, is, this is amazing to me. That, that at one time, everything there was, was in, was in something the size of a head of a pin. They call it the initial singularity. Uh, I, I prefer to call it God. That's fine. In, the scripture says, in the beginning, God. And that, that in one second, what we call the Big Bang, everything went, expanded to 100 million miles. Here's what the um, expert on all things, Wikipedia, says about it. <laughs> the initial singularity was a singularity of seemingly infinite density and mass thought to have contained all of the mass and space-time of the universe before quantum fluctuations, and let me insert here, or a decision of God, caused it to rapidly expand in the Big Bang and subsequent inflation, creating the present day universe. I just, I can't comprehend that. Wow, that's incredible. The amazing works of God. So how, how do we respond to those kinds of works? How do we respond to the goodness of God and the greatness of God? God is great. God is good. So let us thank him. We respond with thanksgiving, with gratitude. I suspect you are familiar with the 100th Psalm. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. And his faithfulness continues through all generations. I didn't even notice it until the 945 service. We just sang, O oh, gratefully sing of God's power. Great is God and God's love. Good is God. Diana Butler Bass has written a new book called Grateful. It just came out in 2018. Grateful, the transforming power of giving thanks. And what the, the point she makes is that gratitude is not an emotion. Well, it is an emotion, but it's not just an emotion. That real gratitude is an ethic. It's a way of life. It includes our actions. It includes our words. It includes our emotions. It's a way of living. It is both a feeling and a choice, a way to respond to the world around us, to be grateful people in all circumstances. 
It happened to me again this week. I was driving from the woodlands where we'd been in annual conference and, and it was dusk. And the, the buildings, the skyline of Houston was just gorgeous. You could see the glistening off of the buildings and um, it was just so beautiful. And I'd, I'd been reflecting on the day's activities and the conversations at annual conference, which were sometimes tense and uh, just so much going on and, and thinking about my own life and some good things and some difficult things and everything. And I was just overwhelmed with thinking, God is so good and I am so grateful. Do you ever have those moments? Those moments where it's just like, poof, it just becomes clear all of a sudden. And the, the, the basic gut response about life, even in difficult times, is, I am so grateful, God. See, I want to live in wow and thanks all the time. I want to be anchored to that so that when the difficult times happen all around me, I can stay focused on the, the thing that doesn't change, the goodness and greatness of God. I want to live in wow and thanks all the time because God is good all the time. And so the discipline of praying the Psalms, of praying about the goodness, the holiness, the righteousness, the justice, the love, the mercy of God, to continue to pray that, I hope will guide my life, will lead me to that place where I live in wow and thanks. Because God is great, God is good. Let us thank you. Gracious God, we do pray that you will break through our confusion and give us that sense of clarity about your goodness and your love and your power. And that whatever happens, we can stay anchored to that and respond to you with gratitude. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.